There are related tax programs, the refundable medical expense supplement I covered. There is a supplement for the working income tax benefit. There's the children's fitness amounts. There's a disability supplement. If you pay a minimum of $100, there's an extra $500 credit that you get if you have a child with a disability. There's the registered education savings plan. Any child born in 2004 or later should have a education savings plan open for them because they get money. It's just given to their account if they have an account open. And they can go to school part-time if they're certified as disabled. There are rollovers of RSPs, RIFs, and RDSPs for financially dependent infirm grandchildren and, and children. <coughs> There's a certification for disability. For the RDSP required, but you get the 90,000 in bonds and matching grants. The home buyer's plan was increased to 25,000 and there's a disability program you can qualify for. Um, you can borrow against an RSP to purchase a house for a person with a disability. So if you wanted to, for example, a home rather, <coughs> if you wanted to, for example, to purchase an apartment for someone with a disability, you could use part of your RSP and borrow against it and pay it back over time. There's a home buyer's amount and there are other home my, homeowner, that was a one year program that's gone. Okay. There's something else to consider. If you have the disability tax credit for a child, there is a supplement to the child tax credit. It's 2600 a year for 2014 to 15. So you start to see that the money for a person with a disability, you've got a $7,000 credit, you've got a disability supplement of another $4,500, plus you've got this $2,600 child tax credit extra amount, plus you've got all these extra credits for fitness and programs. So if you've got or know somebody with a child with a disability or an adult with a disability that is being supported by family, having the disability tax credit provides you access to all these government programs. Now what if you don't qualify for the disability amount, but the person is infirm? Let's go back and look at this summary for uh, let's grandma gets her own disability amount here but let's go look at Marion because grandma couldn't use her disability amount it transfers to Marion Marion also gets an infirm amount that she can claim for the child she gets the extra two thousand dollars plus she can also claim grandma and the niece so she gets substantial credits for people that live with her that are infirm. How do you support infirm? Well, if somebody has the disability tax credit, Canada Revenue is saying that they will accept if you have the disability credit that you're infirm. If you don't have the disability credit, you have to go to a doctor and get a certification in writing. And the certification in writing for a child is more onerous than for an adult. You have to, because a child doesn't do th stuff for themselves right away anyway, they can't, you can only claim an infirm child if you have to do more for them than you would have had to do if they were just a regular child. Like a regular child has its diapers changed, that kind of thing, right? So you have to feed them up until a certain point. So the infirm credit is only where you do more for the child than what you would have normally done. Now let's go to some questions. We're at our hour, Lana, this hour has just flown by. I wish I had more time. But let's go look at the questions and I'm gonna leave up on the screen that there are a lot of other programs that may apply in your province or federally that relate to family support for people with disabilities or a lot of medical expenses. And where can you find <coughs> more information? Well, 
I've been accumulating information on my website for years and I'm going to show you how to get there. Under learn about tax on the tabs at the top, there's these tabs across the top, the learn about tax tab, there's a tax for family affairs and under that page are some major links that you can read about and then down here under families, tax is a family affair, there's a blurb and then there's key information where can you find this information? Well, if you click, click on these links, there's a guide that Canada Revenue, these are all Canada Revenue Agency website links. I'm not taking you to bad places when you click on these links. The RC4064 is the guide for medical and disability related information that Canada Revenue Agency provides. The TD1 forms, there's a direct link. I talked about requesting to reduce tax re deductions at source that for things that aren't on the TD1. There's the application form for the disability tax credit. There are a list of medical expenses found here. And there are only four medical expenses that require the disability tax credit. They're listed here. There's the T929, which is disability supports deduction, which you can read about yourself. IT513 is about a 30 page document and it's where the definition of support is found. And that definition of support is the basic essential support I talked about. Food, clothing, shelter, not money. You have to pay for this stuff yourself. There's some tax tips, what's new, articles and links to more useful information, a page from Canada Benefits, CRA, Persons with Disability page. There's all kinds of information here that you can read at your leisure afterwards there's some definitions there's a list of where the doc which doctors are certified in which province to be able to certify you for various medical expenses and here I want to show you something just before I take questions this is the income tax act on the justice website and the justice website lists all of the medical expenses under number two here medical expenses you know how I talked about how there's 150 medical expenses well this is the list this is in the actual law, what you can claim and how you can claim it and what the documentation is that's required for making a claim. So if you're looking for the very specific wording to see if your situation fits, for example, for reasonable expenses related to alterations of a driveway of the principal residence of a resident of the patient who has a severe and prolonged mobility impairment to facilitate the patient's access to a bus. That is a very specific wording, okay? But in the guide on the Canada Revenue Agency website, it might only say alterations to driveway. So you need to go look at the Income Tax Act. Another one, for reasonable moving expenses for a mobility impairment. If somebody has limited mobility, and they're moving into a care facility, $2,000 of their moving cost is a medical expense. If they're moving into a facility uh, or a new, new home with wider doorways and accessible bathroom, the cost of renovating could be a claim. If they're building a new construction and there is additional costs to accommodate for disability, there could be, if it's for a specific person it could and it meets the criteria, it could also be claimed as a medical expense. There are so many different kinds of medical expenses and the rules are very specific. You cannot claim a cosmetic deduction anymore. That's been disallowed. But here is the list and that list is found by clicking on this link here to the Income Tax Act. Now there's also a list of devices and equipment and the list of devices and equipment is found on 5700 medical expenses there are a number of devices that can be claimed including a power operated guided chair install used for a stairway a hospital bed an external breast prosthesis a teletypewriter an optical scanner all these devices can be claimed as medical expenses including some new ones that are listed at the end Okay, let's take some questions, and you've all been very patient as I've gone on past my time here. 
Okay, so if you've got questions, you can type them into the question box, and if I don't answer them today, I will um, definitely take a look at them later in the day and answer them on the Canadian Money Saver blog. Okay, so let's look at. Um, okay, there, there are. I'm not. I'm not going to take questions that relate to investments. Um, I'm sorry, but. This session is about family tax credits and I'd like to stay on focus. So if you do have questions about medical and disability related questions, please type away. Okay, so the first question I have here is travel health insurance claimable as a medical expense? Joshi, absolutely yes. If it meets the criteria for being a premium, let's go look at what that is. Okay, I'm going to go back to the um, medical expenses on the CRA website. I just needed to open that up again. And if I go to the Income Tax Act, let's go look at the premiums. Here we are, number Q. Okay, premium contribution, I'm going to go plus on here so that I can make it bigger on the screen. Okay, as a premium contribution or other consideration under a private health services plan. So not a public health plan. So your provincial medical premiums do not qualify here. So your BC Medical and your OHIP and your whatever your other provinces are as names of their plans, you do not have a claim for. But if you pay a premium to a private health plan, in respect of one or more individuals, the individual spouse or common law partner, and any member of the household with whom the individual is connected by blood, marriage, common law partnership, or adoption, except to the extent that the premium contribution or consideration is deducted as a business expense in computing the individual's income from a business. So it's possible to claim your private health service plan premiums as a deduction from self-employed or business income. If you do that, you can't claim it twice. So there's no double dipping. But if you haven't claimed it on a business, you can claim the premiums you pay for private health service plans. Now, you send in what you paid for and they reimburse you 80% or 50% and you pay the balance. You can claim the balance as well. Let me show you how to do that on the tax return. If I go to a medical claim form and I key in 2013 um, 0322 and I pay medical expenses for Marion, and I pay a prescription, and it was for drugs, and I pay $35, okay? Now, I get a refund from Blue Cross for 80%. What's 80% of 35? $28. So I put minus 28, okay? My net claim is $7. That's how you report your claims for medical expenses where you've been refunded. Now you could do that on a spreadsheet or you could key it into a medical program or a medical schedule like this one. But basically you get to claim the net amount you paid plus you get to pay the premiums. So if you paid $1,500 for premiums, you're now up to $1,507, okay? Now let's say you went to the dentist Dr. Smith Dental, and it wasn't for cosmetic purposes, uh, and you paid <clears throat> $1,200 for dental. That goes on there as a claim. Next, you went for glasses. Or contacts, and you spent $2,500. You would claim, so now you're up to $5,000. And if you have no very limited income, remember, everything over 2000 or line 3 
So let's say that Marion, let's just say that Marion earns 30000 a year. <clears throat> so let's say that her income is 30000 That means she's paying 1300 for CPP. It also means she's paying 564 for EI. Let's not worry about the tax. She would end up owing about eight. Oh, she'd get a refund of $840 here. Okay. <clears throat> Why would Marion get a refund even though she's not paid any tax? Because she had a medical expense supplement. Remember I talked about how there's a medical expense supplement? Let's see how high that goes. <clears throat> if we put into Marion's medical expenses, let's throw this up to, instead of being dental, being 1200 let's say that there was a major orthodontic experience happening <clears throat> and she had $10,000 worth of medical expenses. What would happen? She would have a $900 medical expense supplement because she doesn't pay any tax. If we took that up to $20,000, I'm just trying to get to the maximum here. The maximum is $906. Okay? So, Basically, when you pay premiums on medical expenses, everything that you pay over and above plus the premium is claimable net of this line here, which is line 236, and notice it's $900 for, what was that? 3% of line 236, which is $30,000. Now, if there's two people, it's still $900. If there's six people in the family, it's still $900 because it's based on 3% of the person's income. That's why you want to make sure that the best person is claiming the medical expenses by optimizing the medical expenses to make sure that the person with the lowest 3% is the one making the claim. So let's go back and ask, answer another question here. Can medical expenses be accumulated like charitable contributions until they accumulate to a number that's above the 3%? Good question, Steve. <clears throat> How are you? I, I remember your name from an email. Um, sometimes Canadian money savers over the years have emailed me some very interesting questions that I've ended up writing articles about, and Steve is one of those people. So basically, um, what happens with the 3% is that, that, that it's an annual figure. But remember how I talked about the you can claim for any 12 months that ends in the year you can arrange it so that you claim your medical expenses from let's say from February of 2012 to January of 2013 or from March to February or from let's just do that from 2013 <clears throat> to um, sorry from 2012 1101 through two and look what happens here it changes it automatically and says you can only claim any 12 months but it has to end in the year okay so if I happen to have a medical expense from 2012 11 15 let's say I had some more prescriptions for another dollars. Mm, I could claim those in the year, but if I had some prescriptions in 2013, 12, 15, notice what happens. It tells me it has to be within the 12 months. So it's not going to let me do it. But if I put the prescriptions in here, my tax software is pretty smart. It'll bring it forward to next year. And I should keep the receipts in my file to bring forward for the next year. Now, keep in mind, there's another rule I'm going to throw at you here. There's a rule that you can claim the medical expenses in the year you die for the previous 24 months. So anytime you die, the previous 24 months medical expenses can be claimed. So you should always, even if you can't claim them and there's no medical refund, you should always leave them in the file for your executor in case you die. Oh, my coffee's cold. <clears throat> Hope that answers your question, Steve. Okay, is line 452 refundable medical expense supplement applicable only for 2013 or for previous years? Elena, hi. Uh, yes, it's applicable. It's been applicable for many years. And if you haven't claimed medical expenses, this is something I, great question, Elena, because this leads right into something that I never really got to covering. And I'm going to go there right now 
by going back to the CRA website. <clears throat> it's pathetic when your home page is the CRA website, but it is. Okay, so I'm going to go to the CRA website and I'm going to type in to their um, search box, fairness. <clears throat> Taxpayer fairness. Uh, they give us a whole big thing. Okay, that's not my best bet. I'm going to type in to the search box taxpayer relief. And that brings up a form, RC4288. And it brings up an IC bulletin. And it brings up a description of taxpayer relief measures available to Canadians. This is the technical description that says for 10 years, if I haven't claimed my tax refunds, I can go back and make an adjustment under the taxpayer relief provisions. My best bet is to complete a form RC4288. Write that down. RC4288 is a PDF fillable form. I know it's not going to open because I'm really having problems with having too many things open. This is a multi-page form that you complete which asks you tons of leading questions and gives you the ability to, to request a refund for more than three years back. Because right now the rules are that anything three years or older is what they call statute barred. Meaning that the law says that Canada Revenue Agency can open up your return for the three previous years and audit it at any point. Anything prior to three years back requires you to make a request under the fairness provision to request relief to open that year up for audit. Now keep in mind that when you do that, what happens is that your tax return now becomes subject to audit for that year for another three years before it's again statute barred. So before you go opening up your tax return for previous years willy-nilly, you want to seriously consider, do you have the appropriate documentation to prove what you've claimed? If you don't have your bank statements from those years and Canada Revenue Agency comes back and says, we want to do an indirect verification that your income for that year is correct, even though you're not changing how much you reported, you have just given them carte blanche to do that. Okay? So they can go in, look at your tax return. They want to see that your income agrees. So what are they going to do? They're going to say, we want to verify that the deposits you made to your bank account agrees with what you say was income or what you ref got refunded from medical expenses because your deposit from Blue Cross goes to your bank account. So if we add up your net pay and we add up your refunds from your medical expenses, will we get the numbers that agree to your tax return? And if we don't, we can assess you, and this is really awful, but if you type in conviction, Z with an S, Canada Revenue Agency lists the people who have been convicted and gives their names. Randall Scott Bethel of Victoria was sentenced in Victoria Provincial Court for not filing his returns and was fined $2,000 and given six months to pay the fine and the outstanding returns have been filed. Okay, so if you end up in tax court and are convicted, your name goes on the CRA website in the list of convictions by province. And if you want to do some interesting reading to see who's been convicted, this is where you go. The other place you can go to see whether someone's been convicted of a crime is to go to canley.org, which is where all the court cases live, on the Canadian Legal Information Institute. And if you type in someone's name, you very well might find that they come up. Um, I'm just trying to think of a name. Canada Trusco was a very famous court case. There's the Canada Trusco versus Smalley versus Kerry, Canada versus Canada Trusco. That's the case about how to read the Income Tax Act as to content, context, and purpose. So there's various ways to find information about 
court cases because all the court cases are listed by court, by province, either federally or provincially here, and you can go and search for names and cases if you've ever wondered how to read about a case. The judge's rulings are all listed there. It's really interesting reading, actually, to make a, a fun Saturday afternoon. So refundable tax supplements and any other credits that you've heard about today that you haven't claimed, you can go back for as many as 10 years. You use the fairness form. You need to be aware that if you owe taxes that you could be faced with penalties and interest which can be forgiven under what's called the voluntary disclosures program and the voluntary disclosures program provides you with the ability to get the penalties forgiven you go to voluntary disclosure program and read about the criteria of who can make a policy or of a voluntary disclosure what kind of information what's a valid disclosure what do i have to do here's all the rules okay that's a great question, Elena. Thank you. How far back can the caregiver deduction credit be claimed? Well, the caregiver credit has been applicable for many years, longer than 10 years. The caregiver, family caregiver amount, the extra 2000 has been in place since 2011. So prior to that, there wasn't an extra amount for infirmity like there is now that's new as of 2011, that came in the federal budget of 2011. <clears throat> if parents have income and they live alone, but you support them with food and clothes, what tax credit can you claim? Okay, what you can claim <clears throat> would be not the, the um, I'm gonna go to the tax return, Hassan, how are you? Um, I am going to go to the dependent window here, you can't claim they live with you, okay? So you would have to put a no in that box. But when you claim the other credits down here, what would happen is that when you transfer over here, you would get to the infirm over 18 credit, the Schedule 5 infirm over 18 credit. And that credit, if you look at the TD1, I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint because I'm stuck on not being able to get those. Um, I'm just going to find the TD1 here fast. I need the other TD1. This one. Okay. You could claim the infirm 18 and older. So if they have extremely low income, then you can claim them. Because if you read these, the, what's neat about the TD1, and it, when I was trying to figure out how to explain to families with children with disabilities, what are the credits? I discovered that TD1, federal and provincial, provides you with a complete overview of what you can claim in very basic language, and it has the thresholds and the limits which is difficult sometimes to find in one place. It's found on the CRA website, but it's all over the place and it's hard to determine what it is. But if you look at number 10, it says, uh, and I'm gonna go down to the, uh, I, can't, I can't increase the size, but you can on your screen. Number 10, if you support an infirm dependent 18 or older who is you or your spouse or common law partner's relative who lives in Canada, and whose net income for the year will be 6607 or less, enter the full amount of 6589. You cannot claim an amount for a dependent you claimed on line nine as a caregiver amount because those ones live with you, okay? But if the dependent's net income for the year will be between 6607 and 13196, and you wanna calculate a partial claim, you enter it on form TD1WS. The worksheet will give you an appropriate, uh, but if you have the software, it will calculate it for you. So if you have a relative who doesn't get the full amount of old age security and CPP, because if they get the full amount of CPP and OAS, they're getting about 15,000 with the guaranteed income supplement. So they wouldn't qualify. But if you've got a parent from 
a foreign country where they didn't live here long enough and they don't have a lot of income but maybe they have a lot of assets they have money in the bank or you're supporting them then you'd want to look at this calculation to determine now if they're a multimillionaire they've got money in the bank and they've got foreign assets you want to be very careful because you might find that some elderly people who live in Canada have very little income but they have a lot of assets they have money in the bank and they have foreign assets and maybe they have earnings they haven't been reporting you'd want to be very careful with that because foreign income reporting has been beefed up the T1135 form is required if they have foreign assets over a hundred thousand dollars and if they've been earning income you may find you have to do a voluntary disclosure and you can't claim them as a dependent if they've got enough income to live on if they've got enough income or money to live on then you're not going to be able to claim them but if you've got a parent or grandparent who came from another country has no money has no assets lives on their own independently and you're helping support them you have to be supporting them with food shelter and clothing you need to be paying the rent directly you need to be buying their groceries for them you can't give them money I hope that helps I'm 65 years old how should I calculate the optimum amount in my RIF to get the maximum pension income credit oh Gregory what you do is you tell your RIF administrator to give you two thousand dollars on the first of the year because if you died on January 2nd you wouldn't get the two thousand dollar credit unless you'd already received two thousand dollars of RIF income I hope that makes sense let me show you what I mean I'm going to go to the tax return everybody should know this okay when you have I'm going to go to a T4 RIF if I get two thousand dollars in my taxable amount of my RIF now really I should go into let's let's go into grandma because grandma would be the one I'd want to be talking about here okay grandma doesn't have the two thousand dollar credit here right so we're gonna to go to the T4 RIF if grandma takes two thousand dollars out and grandma takes out two thousand dollars she gets two thousand dollars that's how you that's the optimum all right it's that simple because it's based on the lowest tax rate no matter how much grandma earns she has to take a minimum two thousand dollars to get two thousand dollars it's dollar for dollar now if grandma died on the second day of 2013 and she wasn't getting paid out of her RIF until the third day she wouldn't get the two thousand dollars because the wording in the income tax act prohibits the pension income amount if you're dead because once you're dead even though your deemed disposition on your RIF is the entire amount of your RIF if you don't have someone to roll it to tax-free you still don't get the pension amount if you're already dead so make sure that your RIF, that you're taking out $2,000 on day one. So if you die on day two, your estate gets the full $2,000 credit when they file your final return for day one. I discovered that because somebody died prior to getting their RIF in the year. <laughs> and that's when I learned the rule because I went to fill out their tax return for their final return and they had the withdrawal from the RIF but it shows up on a different line when you die so the amount coming out of the RIF deemed on death okay would be deemed receipt by annuitant when, when they're deceased so say she had twenty thousand dollars in her RIF it's deemed to be dis now if she hadn't if she hadn't taken out the two thousand before she died she wouldn't get the credit I've just got to go back here in the RIF let's say she didn't take out the 2000 and she died and she died where's the death date here 2013 01 uh, 02 let's just put that in there 
uh, let's put in here, no, okay, and summary, she wouldn't get the $2,000 amount because it comes out on a different line. Make sense? Okay. Okay, next question. Can self-claim tuition fees reported on a T2202A as business expenses rather than a non-refundable credit? Um, yes, you can, because if you've got tuition fees that relate to your business, you can claim them as a business expense. You can't claim an education amount, but you can claim tuition fees. So if you had over the minimum $100, and say you went to Langara and took a business writing course and it related to your business, you could claim that as a business expense instead of as a tuition amount. So you wouldn't claim it on the tuition amount line. You wouldn't get a part-time or full-time credit because it was just a, a single course, but you could claim the education or the tuition fees as a business expense if it was reasonable to do so. Again, it's the reasonability that you have to consider. Okay, does the period of travel insurance have to be this in the same tax year? What happens if the vacation period is from November to February 2014? Good question. Okay, medical expenses, and you know what? I didn't cover this. Medical expenses relate to the period they are paid. So if you are paying your orthodontist, for example, and the medical expenses are being paid, and I'm just going to go back to the tax return for Bill and Betsy, okay? Their medical expenses are for the calendar year. So if this $1,300 was paid monthly at 100 and whatever per month, then if you shifted these periods, you would have to shift the monthly payments to agree. So these premiums paid and the medical expenses paid have to relate, relate to the period for which you're claiming. So, and it's based on the payment date, which is why it's important to keep your credit card statements if you pay your medical expenses on credit card, because that's gonna prove the payment date. Or if you get a, an annual statement from your dentist that shows the date that they received the money. Now my dentist takes a holiday the last two weeks of December. I send in a check, they don't cash it till January, is it paid in December? No, it's not. It's paid when they received it and when they credit it to their account. So be careful of that one because the payment date is the date on which, and you'll notice at the top of the column here, it says payment date. It has to be paid in that period. The money has to leave your account and be paid. 900 is not the max. It was reduced by 5% of net income over base. Um, Victoria, I'm not, Virginia rather, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Um, I was claiming, okay, let's just go here. This number here will change based on line 236. If the income was 30,000, in this case here for Marion, we had medical expenses this changed to 960 because line 236 changed. So whatever your, because we upped this by 2000, it went up 60 bucks. If I took this 2000 out, it would go back down to 900. So this 3% of line 236 is your 236 line and it's based on whichever taxpayer is making the claim. So in the case of, Bill and Betsy, who are married, her, is it, am I on, I'm on Bill. Bill is at 11.34, Betsy's at 108.4, so I'm claiming it on 108.4 because I get more than if I switched it over to the other taxpayer. I hope that makes sense. Is there a list of the forms and the elections we have to paper file? There is, and I am going to take you there right now. One of the requirements for tax preparers to, I'm just going to go to the CRA website, they changed, oh I know what it is, I upped the font size so it changed how the screen looks. Okay, 
I just brought my font size back down. Um, <clears throat> if you go to the tax preparer's responsibilities, one of the responsibilities is to notify taxpayers of the elections that are required to be filed. Now, there are some prescribed forms for elections, but many of the elections are not prescribed. There is no prescribed forms, but there is a list of all the forms, and it's found here on list of prescribed elections in IC, Information Circular, 07-1. I see 01 in the appendix, you will find a list of all of the prescribed elections that must be paper filed. Okay, this is from a workshop I did earlier in the week for the Bookkeepers Association, and one of the bookkeepers obviously thought to ask me this question, so I'm answering it. Okay, can one take out the 2000 from an RSP to get the 2000 credit? Josh, you have to be old enough to take out the credit, and you have to be 65 or meet the criteria to take your RSP out early. There are some times when it's possible to do that. So, but for the most part, if you go look at the RSP rules, you can't convert your RSP to a RIF until you're old enough and the age is 65, I believe. So you can't start taking your pension sooner and get a pension amount sooner. It would be nice, but not possible. Good question though. So what is the tax line that is used as the income test for the age credit? Ah, good question. Okay, so let's go back to the tax return and I'm just gonna, the simplest way to answer that is to go to a schedule one, go to the age credit and look at the calculation. So the age amount, and I'm just going to increase the size of the, oh, I can't do that. Okay. So the maximum claim for the age amount is 6854. Your net income from line 236 of your return is 36,000. The base amount is 34,000. So the difference is 1,500. You multiply that by 15%, and that gives you the amount that you claim. Now, for each province, there will be a different calculation. So let's go to BC 428, because I happen to know that schedule by heart, being a BC resident. And when I go look at the age amount here, the age amount for BC is different than the federal amount. And you'll find those amounts on each of the TD1s for your province. And here's the calculation for the BC amount. Now you'd have to go look at your provincial amount or territorial amount to see that calculation. Okay, I hope that answers all of your questions. I think I've gone through most of the questions that relate to tax credits. I'll wrap up by um, saying that this workshop has been recorded and it'll be available on the Canadian Money Saver website. It will also be available on my YouTube channel. You can find my YouTube channel by going to my website and my website is taxdetective.ca and you'll find the YouTube channel down here at the bottom. You can also follow me on Twitter or Facebook I have a page, a tax detective page, and I blog frequently about tax. And can you contact me to ask me a question? Yes, you can. I will um, advise you if I'm uncomfortable answering the question. If you're asking specific questions, that can be a challenge. I'm more than happy to point you in the direction of what to read. And that's where I draw the line. I won't give advice unless you're paying me for the advice, and that would mean a contract. So to learn about tax, there are a number of links. I've taken you through the Tax is a Family Affair link, and we've looked at various key information, and there's lots more that you can look at here. You can click to link. You will also find that I have 
a Tax Links Pro portal with links to other topics. So if you are self-employed or you have investments or you're looking to learn more about tax, you could go to Granny Googling. That's for grannies to teach their kids about tax. Um, there's information about keeping records, for example. If you have questions specific to keeping records, here are the rules. And if you go to the links for self-employed, you'll find I have a number of them. And I think we're going to sign off at that point. And I hope you've enjoyed today's workshop and that you um, visit my website to learn more about tax or visit the CRA website to learn more about tax. Just click, click the search box and type in what you want to know. And I think you'll find that there's many, many hours of reading there. So thank you for attending today's workshop and happy tax season to everyone.